Ari Melber of the Nation, uh, and he's going to tell us about uh, some people who are telling, who are saying that Obama is not really handling uh, getting uh, things passed in the in the Congress so well. Um, so Ari, welcome back to the Young Turks. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Um, so Marshall Gans, who is he? Marshall Gans is a pretty prominent organizing expert. He worked with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. He lectures at Harvard now. He advised the Howard Dean campaign and the Barack Obama campaign and led trainings and was consulted on the formation of Organizing for America, which is what became of the campaign's large set of networks, email and otherwise, which was, of course, rolled into the DNC. Um, and as some people feel, never to be heard from much again. <laughs> yeah. So what's, uh, what is Marshall saying that Obama's doing wrong? You know, he spoke out first in the summer in a widely circulated essay that he co-wrote with Peter Dreyer, where he took OFA and, by extension, the White House and a lot of the progressive community to task for not organizing a true, broad, grassroots movement on health care and the economy, uh, and in particular, he chided the, the progressive or so-called progressive groups that are based in Washington for going along with uh, this rather inside baseball, Washington, D.C. approach to all of the legislative battles. And that was in the summer. And then he came back out last week um, with a, some very interesting extended remarks that did not get as much play, although I think they should have, and that's why I wrote this column on thenation.com. And he talked about how to truly galvanize reform that goes beyond the status quo, you have to have a crisis. And a crisis is not really a crisis when it's felt by the poor or marginalized. It's a crisis when it's felt by the powerful. Uh, and that he was still critical of the plotting health care strategy because it wasn't capitalizing on crisis at all, um, but rather trying to make deals with all of these groups that he's concerned will still ultimately thwart uh, any bill, let alone the best bill possible. So I want to cover three things that are uh, that arise out of that. Okay, one is the organizing for America. So that's the 13 million people that you referred to that they were part of the Obama campaign. And he was going to use them, etc. Uh, is Gan saying that they have not been used effectively? And if and if uh, which he is, as you explained, uh, why not? How should they have been used? And what does he think they're being used for instead? Well, one of the things he says, and I'll tell you the quote, he says, by keeping OFA tied directly to the president, then when the president was pursuing a strategy of let's compromise with everyone, you're out in the field trying to mobilize people, but you don't know what, from who, under what circumstances, and Gann says you can't mobilize that way. And then he also says, I'll read the quote, OFA wound up being in a very weird position where they had no program, there was nothing they were clearly fighting for, so there was no strategy, and they were reduced to getting people to make phone calls to legislators who already supported their position, and then act as if that was mobilizing something. So for listeners who get those OFA emails, or occasionally open them, you may find you're in a blue district and you're being told to call a member again to support broad outlines of the health care bill that that member already supports. And that, as, a, as an approach, doesn't seem to do much positively. And then it has a cost, because when you undermine the credibility and the communication on that list, you are demobilizing. And so while I don't think that's OFA's fault, I've written, as you know, I've written that, that a lot of that goes back to the White House and how it boxed OFA in from the start. But when you do that, you're, you're actually severing some of the movements and ties that were built up uh, during 2008. See, uh, they're doing it on purpose. I mean, they, they don't... If you really wanted to run, you know, what Obama said, which is kind of an insurgency campaign once you're in the White House to uh, change the way Washington works, not to play the game a little better, as he said in a campaign ad, but to change the game. Well, you would use those guys against people who are against you, right, and to actually enact change. But they use them to play patty cakes and just call Democrats saying, good job, way to go, all right, or way... You know, way to support the president for the people who are already on board is a total and utter waste of time and, and resources. So yeah, that's right. And I mean, just to jump in, you know, Bill Halter is now running against Mary Landrieu. I mean, excuse me, against Blanche Lincoln. Um, got my Southern moderates confused. And um, but you've got a primary campaign down there. He, he's raised now over a million dollars in a couple days on Act Blue uh, from a lot of progressive groups. No one would expect a sitting president 
to go in and personally intercede in that primary battle. And Barack Obama, frankly, never promised to do that kind of thing on the campaign. But it's not a stretch, I don't think to have OFA engaged in that kind of issue, to poll their members, to let those people see opportunities to engage and support the primary candidate. That doesn't involve the president's time, and maybe the president has better things to do with his time. But that's an area where campaign-style Barack Obama activism might have been more direct and more grassroots, but now they don't even mess with it. So we have to be careful to let them off the hook also by saying, oh, this was never going to work. There are all sorts of creative ways they could have weighed in if they weren't so afraid, the White House advisors, of, of alienating anyone in the Democratic establishment. Yeah, in fact, it's worse than that because Obama stepped in in favor of Blanche. Like exactly. That, instantly, right? And because he doesn't really want to change government, he was lying. He wants to, you know, play the game a little better. So, and in his mind, that's protect every Democrat establishment Democrat there is out there. So now, uh, let's go, go to another uh, part of uh, his criticism here, uh, Marshall Gantz's criticism. He refers to a Saul Alinsky principle, which, by the way, of course, will get you in a lot of trouble on Glenn Beck's program. Uh, but, uh, Aren't we here to get in trouble with Glenn Beck? Oh, sure, of course. You uh, know, I've been on his show. I don't know if you'll forgive me for that, Cenk. Uh, no, it's okay. Some of uh, the finest progressives in the country have, like Eric Massa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, so Alinsky talks about polarizing and depolarizing. Tell us what that is and what you're supposed to do first. Yeah, this is a great part, and, and it'll be familiar to some people, but Gans was discussing how first you always polarize to move people. That creates the urgency for action. But good organizers are somewhat schizoid in that they first polarize and they build up an intensity and an opponent or an enemy or something that you're fighting against and something that you're fighting for, and that can be somewhat divisive. And then you have to be realistic enough and practical enough once you build power uh, to depolarize and to settle or make a deal. Um, and yet, in so many cases on health care, as everyone knows, um, the Obama strategy was quite the opposite. There was all of this talk about settling before you'd exercised or built power. Uh, on little things and on big things and on things that were strategically in the administration's interest to polarize around. For one example, lowering the, the age on Medicare was not only popular, uh, but it was something that its opponents had previously supported. So if you fight that out over a couple of weeks, the people like Joe Lieberman, who are on record having supported it and now are obstructing it, look increasingly bad. And yet, as everyone knows, it was about a 36-hour stretch from Lieberman complaining to the administration dropping it. That would sort of be the opposite of what Alinsky would tell you to do. As the Frangier would say, you shamelessly polarize your supporters, then inviting others to depolarize them. <laughs> Okay, anyway, random, random Star Trek reference. All right, hey, uh, it's your show, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look, get to do these things. Yeah, look, you've been on with Crazy Your Host. You were on with Glenn Beck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, seriously, th that's a really important principle because, and, and when I read that, Ari, in your piece, I thought, oh, well, that's really important because if you take the wind out of people's sails and you say, let's compromise, 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 you take the energy away from the organizing for America, from your, the people who are ready to fight, et cetera, and at the end, if you try to turn it on and say, okay, now let's get angry and, and do this thing, it doesn't make any sense. It's just not logical. That's not how you're supposed to do things. Leading me to my final question, which is, does Obama not know this? I mean, this, this is kind of like the 101 of organizing and politics, et cetera. Uh, when I read this, I, the sense I get is, well, he knew that. It's not that he was stupid. It's that... The objectives aren't what he says they are. The objective was to have a completely watered-down corporatist bill. And if that was your objective, then, hey, wait a minute. You do pol uh, depolarize first and polarize later and take the wind out of your supporters, et cetera, et cetera. Then he played it perfectly. You know, it's a good question. I buy it more for Congress than for him. Uh, Jay Rockefeller claimed to be for the public option until there was actually the chance that a public option might pass on uh, at least possibly on reconciliation, and then at the at the summit he backed off it. You know, Glenn Greenwald famously said, "Well, these guys are craven, but rarely is it is it so obvious." Uh, and so they blame the filibuster, they blame the system, pretending it's preventing them from doing things when in fact they don't want to do those things because either 
they don't care or they have other commitments, other contributions and donors in mind. And I'm not saying we know for certain, but something obviously held Jay Rockefeller back from what he claimed was his priority. I think with Obama it's slightly more complicated because there are examples on the domestic front where it seems that he would have wanted a bigger stimulus and he was quick to compromise, but I wouldn't say that there was no interest whatsoever you know, in a different approach. And I think that his folks expected to get a lot more credit for bipartisanship than they've gotten. Uh, as you know, that was never something I thought was really important to begin with. Um, but they, they thought that by laying out this whole kumbaya outreach, uh, the, the establishment would have given them more room to maneuver, and quite the opposite. They found, I think, that by legitimizing bipartisanship as a value on par with policy, on par with jobs, which it's not, um, actually they fed a media narrative that now is hammering him for trying to get an up or down vote, which I think is crazy. All right, you know, the final thing on this is that, I, I look, on a micro level, I don't think Obama comes in and thinks, I am going to be a corporatist, and I will sell everything out. And I don't want a stimulus package that's larger. I want it to be smaller. I feel like you had a lot of sugar tonight. <laughs> every night, every night. All right, anyway, uh, and, and on the micro level, you see, I think the Democrats probably do, naively did want bipartisan, et cetera. But on the macro level, when you look at the overall picture, Republicans never give a damn about bipartisanship, and the Democrats always do. Yes. But what is the natural result of that? Republicans get money from corporate sponsors. Democrats get money from corporate sponsors. And the, and, and the corporate sponsors and interests are the ones that benefit either way. And, I, and when you look at the bigger picture, I just can't think that in the long run that that's a, um, a coincidence. I think that it's, it's they, the system self-selected those people in those parties to produce this result. I think there's that piece of it, and I also think we have seen a media culture that has a huge influence in Washington, which has a second democracy theory. It's not a theory about whether you can pass things with the folks who are in government. It's this second theory that somehow, no matter what, things are less legitimate when both parties are not lined up for a bill. Um, and I do think that's a factor, and I do think that's warped the political incentives in Washington. It's especially frustrating right now when the Democrats have such a large majority and we have such economic problems. But we do know this is a, a tendency that goes back a ways, and I'm not sure that it's solely corporate. I think it overlaps with the distortive power of contributions in our elections. So I think those are two things overlapping, but I don't know that they're driving each other directly. All right. R. Melba from The Nation. Very interesting conversation as always. Thanks Thank you, and us. thanks to your listeners. Yeah. Absolutely. All right.